So now that we've imported something from Blender with shape keys into Unreal Engine with morph targets, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go check out this video or this video actually, something along those lines, somewhere around here in the corner to see that tutorial. Uh, we're going to import that into Unreal. So a while ago, I made this little model over here. And uh, this is the perfect example because it's got a number of different shape keys applied to it. It's got the bases, the mouth, and uh, the, the mouth animation does uh, the following, as you can see. That's just the action animation. And then it has a bunch of shape keys which just deform it a little bit in that direction, a little bit in that direction. Uh, if you don't know about how to make shape keys, I already did cover that. Uh, I covered how to import them into the Unreal Engine. So that's what we're going to be doing right now. I already made a example for you guys to see what it's going to look like uh, when we are done with this. So, what this is, is a slow morphing organic animation, and this will never loop. Because these morph keys are changing at different speeds. And we can randomize those, and in that regard, statistically speaking, yes, there's a chance that at some point they will all overlap, but with the amount of randomization and the amount of shape keys that will work in here, it's going to be very unlikely to overlap. So let's get started here. We're going to start by making a new actor. Now that we've made our new actor, we're going to add a skeletal mesh to it. And that skeletal mesh will set to the uh, morph target uh, applied mesh that we just imported. Then going over into the event graph, we can, for the purpose of this video, if your actor needs these events, you can always add them in back later. We only need the event begin play. You can delete the other two. Uh, because we're going to make a new custom event, and we're going to call that Timeline 1. You can call it whatever you want, but just for purposes of it being easily understandable, just call it Timeline 1. Uh, and from that, we're going to uh, add a timeline. Who would have thought, right? Um, it's called Timeline 0, so actually, let's go back here, uh, F2 to change the name, and call this Timeline 0, just to have things be consistent. Uh, and when we open that timeline by double-clicking it, we can add a track. So adding a track uh, will allow us to choose from a number of different tracks. We're going to need a float track here. And before you do anything else, before you forget, toggle use last keyframe, because usually the length uh, will be put in here. Uh, I like to use just use last keyframe. That way, the moment the timeline reaches the last keyframe in the timeline, it just acts as if that's the end of the timeline, which is great. We're going to right click and add a key to curve float. And we're going to put that on time point zero, and the value is going to actually be negative 0.5. And that will become apparent really soon as to why. Uh, you add a second one, you're going to add that into time one, and value 0.5. Why do I go negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 here? Well, if we go back to our morph keys here, you will see that the basic unmorphed mesh is a value of zero. That goes all the way up to a value of one or all the way down to a value of negative one. Now, it depends on how you made your shape keys in Blender. Because if you exaggerated them a little bit, like I did, you probably don't want to go exactly to either end of that spectrum. So what I end up doing is still having a window of a value of a total of one, negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. I will cycle between those two. You could, if you wanted to, and you made your model that way, even make a, uh, a, a timeline that goes from negative one to positive one. Uh, you can really do whatever you want with these. So do be creative with this, but for the time being, we're going to stick with negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. Back in the event graph, uh, we need to do something with that data. So we're going to drag out this skeletal mesh while holding control so we can drop it in as a variable. And we're going to drag off that and set morph target. Now, the new track we made, new track zero, you can name it whatever you want. Uh, we probably should. Uh, I'm not going to. We will hook up into the value of the set morph target. And that will be uh, the update pin of the timeline. Now, this really already does what we needed to do. If I go into the game right now and I spawn in, um, I obviously do need to um, <laughs> have the timeline zero event at begin play, um, but it will do this movement once. Uh, it's very important that we uh, cycle it though. So how do we do that? Well, once we finish, 
we uh, again run timeline zero. We can't just hook it up into play every single time because after one time it's it's not going to cycle back, it's going to be cutting, it's not going to be playing from the start, it's going to be doing all sorts of weird things. So what we do coming off of timeline zero is we add a flip-flop. Uh, a flip-flop is a node which will allow you to, first time we come through here, it will do whatever we get from A, which would play from start, and the second time it comes through, it will do whatever we tell it in B, which is reverse from end. Then the third time it gets through, it will go back to A. The fourth time, it will go back to B, etc, etc. So this way it will always be cycling back and forth between playing it forward and playing it backward. So there will never be any weird cutting. Now, I'm, I'm hearing you say, I'm hearing you fucking scream at your, uh, at your monitor saying, but this time is only a second long. That is very, very short, and you are entirely correct. So what we will do in order to combat that, it's actually remarkably easy. We're going to drag timeline zero in much the same way we dragged the skeleton mesh before out of our variables here, and we're going to drag off that uh, set play rate. Now, this set play rate uh, will make your timeline go faster or slower depending on the rate you put into it. What we're going to do is we're going to put a divide into it. Why? Well, if we divide one by whatever number we put into the bottom, the bottom number will be the amount of seconds the timeline will be long. One last thing that you definitely should not forget is to put in the morph target name. Uh, the morph target name you can easily get from just going to your morph targets, copy names, going back to your node and pasting it in. It's as easy as that to oversee something. It's really easy to just forget, but uh, then when you actually do put in the name, you can see it's very slowly now going upward. And then when it reaches the end of that in about like another two seconds or right as I speak, it'll start going down. This is the basic idea. We will be doing this for every single morph target, but we can do you a little bit better because we can, instead of making this a static number, we could make this a variable so that we can impact that during gameplay. So maybe the closer we are to it, the slower it moves. That could be very interesting. That's not what we're going to do here today. What we're going to do is we're going to hook up a random float in range. And it's a little bit of experimentation here uh, as to what range will work for your morph targets. Uh, I already uh, hooked something up here uh, in my test actor and I found that things between generally like 7 and 15 would work decently well. And once you hook that up, every time this uh, event runs, it will use a different set play rate. And the timeline will take a different amount of length to complete. Now, that's the basic ID. If you multiply that by all the shape keys we have, you get something a little like this, where every single one of these random ranges in float is even different. So every single timeline, every single time it runs, is going to have a random duration between two different numbers. The universe will probably die out before any of these um, actors will actually like do a loop and have a overlapping point where they all start their animation at the exact same time over again. So you can be pretty sure that once you add in uh, this actor, which again, we're going to uh, go back to the one that I made before, you can look at this as long as you want. You're never going to see it perfectly loop. You might see things that look like looping, but it's always going to have subtle differences in the way that these tentacles move about. If you enjoyed this video, do not forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel uh, for more of this content. Do let me know what should I uh, talk about next. There's so many things in game development that we can talk about. So do let me know what you want to hear me talk about. Until the next time, I'll see you all back then. Bye.